Hello, my name is Alexander Campanella. This is Ethos 1.1. That means chapter one, verse one of Ethos, my first book I just published. Today we will conquer nihilism, despair, and postmodernism with one verse. Let's do it. Okay, so Ethos, complete happiness and excellence by way of virtue and reason. By me, Alexander Campanella. I just published this uh, yesterday. Uh, it will be free until February 14, 2020, on most ebook sites except for Amazon. Amazon uh, has some special thing where they don't let you uh, distribute your book for free. Sorry. <laughs> In the video description, I will put all the links to Apple, iBooks, Sony, Barnes & Noble, Scribd. It's on all of these major sites. It's a very short book, only 400 verses, 100 pages. You can read it very quickly. So what is ethos? Ethos is a Greek word going all the way back to ancient Greece basically means character. Ethos is the root word for ethikos, where we get ethics in English. So this is interesting because when we say ethics in English, uh, what, we're, what we really mean, whether we know it or not, is ethical character. So many people think ethics when they hear the word ethics in English, they think, oh, this is about the rules, the laws, what's good or bad, what's right or wrong, ethical behavior, unethical behavior. Uh, that's not it. Real ethics is all about character, which means it's actually very personal, which can be bad for many people, but it's still much better than this impersonal, follow the rules, uh, one plus one is two kind of uh, dry science kind of field of study. That's not what it is. Real ethics, as you'll see from uh, my book based on Aristotle, it's about character and happiness. That's actually ethics. That's what it means. So this book, The Ethos, uh, comes directly from Aristotle. So that means I took the Nicomachean Ethics by Aristotle. So I took the most important verses across the entire text, and then I reorganized it so it had a, a good flow to it, which it, did, it doesn't originally, actually. And uh, then I also changed the English a bit so it's more readable for modern American English readers. And that's it, that's the ethos. Um, and this is the quintessential text on ethics, ethos. It's also the first ever self-help book. And nobody realizes this, but that's the truth. And because it's made by Aristotle, it's the best. <laughs> Sorry. So he was not just a great philosopher. He was born uh, much later than most of the other ancient Greek philosophers, Socrates and Plato. Um, so, he was in a perfect situation just by timing to summarize all the previous philosophy in Greece and categorize it beautifully. And he was a categorical thinker anyway, it seems. So, hopefully, um, I'll do many more videos in this lecture series about ethos. My book, which, like I said, only has 400 verses, but the verses, even though you can read them quite easily, are very dense. One verse, you know, you can break down and get all sorts of goodies from it, as you'll see in this lecture. So the name of the game is Complete Happiness Through Virtue of Character. And this is super simple. Like I said, there's no rules, no laws. Although from this ethos, you can derive a legislative system and and all that, of course. But it's so simple, any child can easily understand this. You think good thoughts, your thoughts become behaviors, 
your behaviors when repeated become habits and you keep those habits long enough, then you have character. And when you have all the virtues of character uh, habitualized into your yourself, your nervous system, your soul, whatever you call it, that's complete happiness. And it's obviously true uh, because the virtues include truthfulness, generosity, friendship. So, of course, if you have good friends and you're a good person with your friends and your friends are good people, I mean, any problem you have in your life, your friends will take care of you, you'll take care of them. This is just the best way to live life. You just have all the virtues. You're just good at everything. This is what Aristotle taught Alexander the Great, who later uh, conquered the world without losing a single battle. And that's pretty cool. So the first verse in Ethos 1.1 may seem obvious at first, especially if you are already having some ethos yourself. Uh, but even if it's obvious, hidden between the lines, or I should say presupposed by the verse, is actually everything we need to conquer these horrible maladies of nihilism, despair. Um, these are really serious issues. Uh, if you're nihilistic and you don't check it, you can become clinically depressed, bitter, uh, commit suicide. Like these are really terrible things. And uh, I will show you how to use just one verse to uh, uh, take down these uh, maladies. All right, ethos, one, one. There is a highest good. All other goods are subordinate to the highest good. That's it. Two sentences, one verse. So first we'll break down the first sentence. There is a highest good. So I wrote down four different presuppositions uh, from which we can say there is a highest good. One, this implies some things are good or bad. Two, of those things that are good, some can be more or less good. Three, of all the variety in good things, at the top stands the highest good. And number four, we could also assume there is a lowest bad. And uh, we won't talk about that today because that's so negative and depressing. Okay, presupposition one, some things are good or bad. This we can very easily agree on. Uh, every day, if we are awake, we notice things we like or dislike. So some may say, oh, well, Mr. Alexander, if you want to propose this, uh, this ultimate moral theory of truth, uh, and everything is just a hallucination, then how can we say there is a highest good? Maybe I like something, but I'm, my perception is faulty, or, uh, you know, we're all in the matrix, something like that. That could be true, and it doesn't matter. So even if our likes and dislikes, uh, perception, it's all hallucinations, our experience of them is still real to us. And our happiness, which is the goal, it's not just to write down, oh, this is good, this is bad. That's not ethics. The goal is happiness, complete happiness. This life is based on our experience. It doesn't matter if it's real or not, as long as we are working with our personal, direct experience. And like all classical timeless wisdom of Confucius, Aristotle, the Buddha, it doesn't matter. Uh, if it's Genuine wisdom, it will be about experience. Now, it is possible that some people, hopefully not too many people watching this now, uh, do not have any likes or dislikes, and uh, they're just neutral about everything. So, as I see it, there is a positive and negative uh, form of this kind of... Uh, severe neutrality. Um, in its negative form, I would call it clinical depression. 
So this means uh, extreme lethargy, uh, apathy. Uh, if you don't have any likes or dislikes and it's negative, that means you won't do anything. You'll just sit around doing nothing all day. And uh, this will greatly hinder your happiness. That's why it's negative, And that's why we call it depression. If you cannot take care of your loved ones or you cannot go to work because you just don't have any feelings of good or bad in the world, that's negative, And that's called depression or apathy, something like that. Now, there is a positive form as well, a very positive form, which is actually an essential aspect of enlightenment, one of the highest perfections any human can achieve. And so this is when you have spent all of your karma. Uh, this is from Buddhism and Hinduism, both. Uh, it's a kind of detachment. So if you don't have any at least in the material world, if you don't have any likes or dislikes and you're completely detached from them because you're more interested in just uh, living moment to moment, uh, that's enlightenment, actually. That's very positive. And uh, many people don't realize this when they hear about this detachment in Zen Buddhism or other kinds of Hinduism. They think, oh, you know, this is just like uh, apathy or Oh, well, if you don't like or dislike, if you don't have any desires, how can you do anything? Well, uh, easily, <laughs> basically. Uh, being detached doesn't mean you don't have uh, feelings or desires or anything. It means you just don't need to act on them. You can just exist. And that's actually what we are. We are existence and consciousness localized within a body. So if you identify with that, uh, pure awareness, consciousness, the soul, the self, whatever it is, and you do not identify with what your body wants or needs, that's actually called enlightenment. And that's actually higher than ethos. Um, but that's not the focus of this lecture. So let's continue. All right, there's a second presupposition for it. There is a highest good. This presupposes of those things that are good, some can be more or less good. For example, this is, like I said, this is probably obvious, but we're just going to use a very mundane, obvious example so we can uh, standardize systematically the way we proceed through, through everything here. So dogs are good. Why? Dogs give us companionship. Uh, they can be trained to do useful things for us. So, okay, let's just say dogs are good. Even if you disagree, let's just go, go for it. At least for some people. So, based on the criteria I just mentioned, we can show that some dogs are more or less good depending on those two criteria. How much they are offering us companionship, we can just judge our own feelings. Oh, do I feel he's my, my good friend? Or is he biting all my, my guests? Well, then that's not a good dog. And also how easily or effectively they can be trained to do useful things for us. So a good dog, based on this just made up example and criteria I made up, it could be anything. A good dog is a good friend. You feel happy and friendly around the dog. And uh, you can easily train this dog to get you a beer, uh, be a guard dog, whatever it is. And a bad dog, you'll feel very suspicious of, oh, he's not a good companion, or uh, you can't train it to do anything. So there you go. Some dogs are more good or less good, as with all other things. Presupposition three, of all the variety in good things, or I guess we could just say, of all the good things, or of all the goods, at the top stands the highest good. It's the most important of all the presuppositions, of all the logic we're working through. And here is the simplest way to prove this visually, mathematically. Here we have the highest good we'll call 100. 
here, we have the lowest good will cause zero. That's it. Um, so this may seem like an assertion, but you know, within this number line, there's 92.4, and then there's many different things that seem like 87, but uh, you, the more you figure it out, the more you see where everything fits within this invisible number line. We don't actually see things this way in our daily life, but this uh, logos or this this truth is it's uh, it's metaphysically true underneath all of this physical, emotional, psychological reality in which we live. All right, so because this is important, there are some ob objections someone may raise, so I will steel man those objections, and uh, I think this is important. If this is too much logic for you, that's okay. You can skip ahead to the good stuff. So someone may say, what if there is no way to put a numerical scale to a certain set of goods? My refutation is, <laughs> as I said in the last slide, the number scale, it's always there. We just don't see it sometimes, but it's always there. So I'll try to give you an example. Let's say I want to eat an apple. There are 12 apples I can choose from. One of them, without my consciously knowing, is best for my taste buds, my digestion, my mood, given a certain set of circumstances and a specific time or moment. And this will be changing every moment. I have no way to know for sure which apple is best or worst or in between. I can make an estimate, but most people really don't know for sure. But I have to choose an apple because I, I want to eat an apple. So what I do is I'll make estimates to draw out this uh, number scale of value. At the highest point, I think, is the Granny Smith apple. So I eat the Granny Smith, and mm, it's not perfect. It's not what I was looking for. Uh, why? Because I didn't factor in my digestive system and uh, made my stomach feel weird. So actually, a red apple would have been much better. So what just happened? There was this arbitrary is the wrong word, an estimated scale. Uh, in which place uh, the Granny Smith was at the top and the red apple was at the bottom. That was just my estimate based on the information that I had and my perception. Now, as I said before, the real scale, the real value scale, it's always there. I just couldn't see it. Now, in this moment, in this example, uh, the red apple was the best apple, the highest good for me to choose. And the Granny Smith apple was actually worst. All right, so how do we find out um, what is the highest good within um, any set of goods within our life for our thoughts, behaviors, habits? This is all in the ethos. It's all in the book, uh, and I'll probably do another lecture about that later. Objection two. What if there is more than one thing that is the highest good? This is actually a really good objection. And actually, this does happen a lot within our daily lives, within our experience. But just as in the first refutation, there's actually that real number scale from, we'll call it 100 to zero, which you could also measure in any other numerical way. It's that part is arbitrary, but the, the scale of value from lowest to highest, however you measure lowest, however you measure highest, it's always there. We just can't see it. So now I'll show you how you can reduce uh, a small set of goods that you think are, are all the highest goods. I'll show you how to reduce that into just one highest good. So I have two red apples. They both look great. They're the same in every way I can perceive. So I'm just going to flip a coin to decide which one to eat. So I flip a coin. It's heads. 
and I decided beforehand that if it was heads, I would eat the apple on the right. Done. That's it. So I eat the apple on the right. So what did I just do? By flipping the coin, I use a neutral third party coin to determine which of the goods is the highest good. So in that moment alone, there was a set of two highest goods, and I flipped the coin, it became one highest good. But wait, isn't the coin arbitrary? Yeah, it is. So this works because we make a promise to ourselves to stick to the result uh, we get from random chance. Uh, when, and, but this only works when all other things are equal. So if we assume every single thing is 100% equal, which does frequently happen just within our own faulty uh, senses experience, sometimes even if we're lazy and we don't want to put in extra work to find out what the highest good is, that's okay. That, it still applies in that situation. Um, the promise we make to ourselves to abide by the results of the coin flip acts like a judge on the highest good. And it's actually a legitimate judge because if we go against the coin flip and all other things are equal, we're actually going against ourselves and our word to ourselves. And this is way worse than choosing the wrong apple. So if you're a person who has this problem, you flip a coin and you go, oh, that wasn't the coin flip I wanted it to be. That wasn't the result I wanted it to be. And you keep flipping the coin more, that's incontinence. And that's a very uh, important vice to overcome. It's very common. There's a whole chapter on it in ethos. All right, second sentence in the first verse. All other goods are subordinate to the highest good. So if one good is the highest good, is it necessarily true that all other goods are subordinate to this highest good? You might say maybe some goods are more good than others, but not subordinate. So let's consult a dictionary. This is, there's nothing shameful in this. Um, there are three definitions of subordinate. This is from like dictionary.com, I think. Uh, first, placed in or belonging to a lower order or rank. Two, of less importance, secondary. Three, subject to or under the authority of a superior. Okay, so definitions one and two are obviously true in this case. If some goods are, are more or less good than others, it does mean by necessity that those goods are of lower rank or importance. Because if they weren't of lower rank, there could not be more or less of a good. Not in quantity, but a higher good or a lower good. So that was a presupposition two of the first sentence. So definition three could be true as well. It probably is, uh, but we don't really care. We don't need to look deeply into it because um, ethos and this lecture series, this book, our lives are about living. It's about experience, consciousness. That's basically it. Now, our relationships, our virtues, these are all important, but all of these are part of what we could simply call our lives, our experience. And for that, it's just good enough to know that some goods are higher or lower than others. That's enough for now. Okay, so the logic uh, exercise is all over. So we have a good enough understanding of the verse and its implications to uh, take down. Nihilism, despair, postmodernism. Ooh, these are horrible things. Uh, so we will conquer our ignorant foes with our superior knowledge one at a time. Let's bang them out, starting with nihilism. Okay, here we are. First, let's just read a dictionary definition for nihilism. And I won't talk about despair uh, explicitly, 
for the rest of this lecture because despair is basically just a part of nihilism. You can't be nihilistic without also having despair. And if you have despair, you're probably nihilistic. So nihilism, a doctrine that denies any objective ground of truth and especially of moral truths, a viewpoint that traditional values and beliefs are unfounded and that existence is senseless and useless. That's a two-parter. So Ethos 1.1 shows us that we can always find an objective ground of truth in any set of goods. Um, and I'm stressing always because I chose mundane examples. So if I, if I chose a very difficult ethical example where, you know, a common one is like, oh, you have to kill 10 people to save a thousand. Is it moral or immoral? <laughs> Those examples are good, you know, to get us thinking about certain things, except they're actually not good. Um, the essence of uh, morality is just practical wisdom. It's just determining what is good or bad and what it makes us more or less completely happy um, and what is better or worse for uh, improving our character, our ethos. Uh, so actually, a mundane example or a very difficult example, in essence, it's the same. Metaphysically, it's the same. So actually, I, I always will use mundane examples as much as possible. And uh, this is how all wise men are, by the way. Confucius, the Buddha, uh, those are good examples. The Buddha is a really good example. But uh, any, uh, any, I mean, probably uh, St. Thomas Aquinas and other Western sages, there's good examples there. They always start with the most mundane, an obvious example that any child can easily understand to prove the most difficult or deep or complicated thing. And if that mundane example doesn't work, then you go a level higher to get a little bit more complexity. And then you, if you absolutely need to, then you can go a little bit higher. This is um, good ethos. It's a good method for uh, understanding and applying things. It's uh, also found in craftsmanship. And then the second part of the sentence was denying any ground of truth and especially of moral truths. So ethos 1.1, the first verse of ethos, it's, it's not just asserting about moral truths. It's actually asserting the truth about any set of goods. But later in the ethos, we see complete happiness is the highest good for us. That's it. I mean, ethos 1.1 shows us there is a highest good, and there are goods that are higher or lower within a, a, a value scale. So that's our objective ground of truth. That's, that's, I mean, it may not be everything you, you need to, to do some, I don't know, some work in quantum physics or something, but for our daily life, that's actually an objective ground of truth from which we can stand and build a life, build a complete life. Um, and then once we accept, once we see and accept that a complete happiness is the highest good for ourselves, then it's even easier to see that being honest, for example, is objectively more moral, morally choice worthy and true than uh, being dishonest, and, and that decision, being honest or dishonest, that decision is higher than the decision of which apple to eat because it's more uh, essential to our complete happiness. So the more you read ethos and the more you actually practice it, the more you can clearly see this uh, hierarchy of values and goods, um, which can be, like I said, subjective. Like my complete happiness is achieved a certain way, which is different from yours, that's fine. If we as humanity can actually get to that level where we are all at a high level of ethos and complete happiness, yeah, maybe then we can talk about some objective ground of truth, some world religion or something like that. Let's forget about it though, okay? 
second sentence of nihilism definition. A viewpoint that traditional values and beliefs are unfounded and that existence is senseless and useless. So traditional values and beliefs are unfounded. Well, ethos is based on Aristotle. Aristotle is traditional. And as I hope you can see from the first verse here, it's founded very well. This logic is very well founded. It's, I never heard anyone disprove it. Um, it's like I said, for me and many others, it's simply obviously true. But if you do want to, you know, try to work your ways around it, I've tried to show a common objection and refutation in that way. Um, so I personally believe this is not only well-founded, but one of the most solidly founded texts of all the ancient texts and modern texts that I've read. I just hope I've already shown that well from the first part. That's why I did the first part first. All right, this is the crucial part. Existence is senseless and useless. This is like the, the core aspect of nihilism, why it's so dangerous and negative. So Ethos 1.1, teaches us there's always something better to look forward to because there's always the highest good to be found. We may not see it all the time, but it's always there. So it's up to us to find that good and pursue it. That is the usefulness of our existence. That's why we're here. Um, so actually existence is not senseless, it's senseful. And uh, we've actually evolved biologically, it seems, to constantly seek out the highest good. The way our eyes work, um, especially for men, <laughs> um, the, the way our digestive tract, you know, looks for certain foods more than others, our entire, you know, not our, I mean, most of our consciousness is all about constantly aiming at that highest good wherever it is. So this is simply wrong. Now, here's a really funny thing. Isn't it odd that senseful is not a word in English, but senseless is a word? I just thought that was very telling about English language, English culture, etc. I won't go into it. Um, but if you do want to know more about how our nervous system, the neuroscience, the biology behind how we are constantly seeking out a the highest value, highest good within a, a certain set of, of goods or a hierarchy of values or goods, uh, check out Jordan B. Peterson. He has good lectures on that, very entertaining to watch and uh, educational. And on my YouTube channel, you can see many Peterson videos. Now, postmodernism. This definition is from Britannica.com. It's actually really difficult to get a good definition of postmodernism. This is very new starting in like 1974, I think, was the first uh, big postmodernist philosopher. Okay, here it is. In Western philosophy, a late 20th century movement characterized by broad skepticism, subjectivism, or relativism, a general suspicion of reason, and an acute sensitivity to the role of ideology in asserting and maintaining political and economic power. So I underlined relativism and suspicion of reason. Those are the two most important parts here. So ethos 1.1 one, one, um, it's very well founded, and you can use it, you can use it for any text that want that, that you want to be based in some kind of solid truth. Uh, this this first verse is an excellent place for anyone to start in any kind of, anyone who wants to be truthful or objective, this is the best way to do it, I think. After all, it comes from Aristotle, who is probably the greatest philosopher ever. So, you know, even if you're not into the logic, the philosophy as I am, why not just accept it? You know, he's well known as one of the best, probably is the best. Why not just take his word for it? It's much better than taking than watching, you know, the news and, and taking their word as ultimate truth. That's nonsense, absolute nonsense. You know, the, if you go to church or the temple and, and you take their religious text as the ultimate truth, 
that's okay. That can work. Even if you're at a corrupt church or temple, there's at least something there. But, you know, following anything from the modern media is an absolute nightmare. That's that's where postmodernism, I think, comes from, is, is the onslaught of modern media, TV media. This is just terrible. Okay, so we use ethos 1-1 to uh, give us a metaphysical and moral ground from which to stand on. And within this solid ground, there can be no relativism. It just doesn't survive. Uh, once you go through the logic, the presuppositions, presuppositions behind the assertion, when you go through the logic as I have, if you, if you see the truth and just accept it, all you have to do is remember. There could be relativism that still pops up you know, if you're incontinent or intemperate or if you have any of the other vices mentioned in ethos, that's okay. You just remember. Uh, you can just repeat ethos 1-1. Just repeat the verse again as a mantra. It will work. Um, so the introduction in my book uh, goes more into detail on how to actually use this, uh, this wisdom in an effective and daily practical way. If you're reading some verse in ethos and you can't accept it as true, one thing you can do is what I've showed you in this lecture. You break down linguistically and logically each little section bit by bit and you say, well, what do I have to say in order for this to be true? That's the presupposition. And then you can even presuppose it even further backwards. So you lay it all out and if you can find the logic that leads up sequentially across the board and you cannot refute that logic, you, that's the truth. Maybe it's not the highest truth. It doesn't matter. As long as you can see it and accept it as true for you, you're good. You, you have ground to stand on and from which you can live your life. Postmodernists are suspicious of reason. I won't go into this because this is actually personal, I think. I think this is this comes from people who have personal negative experience from hyperly scientific or hyperly left brain super rational people. Like let's say you're a little girl and your father's a scientist and and uh and your father ig ignores your feelings because he says, oh, they're not real. And we're all just atoms and this and that. And oh, look at me. I'm saying this because I'm so good at reason. So that's actually a you know legitimate experience. I'm sure many girls go through and boys too. And they think, oh, maybe I shouldn't follow this, this whole reason rationality thing. Now, of course, this is wrong because the scientist in that example, he's not reasonable. <laughs> As you'll see in the ethos, friendship is actually the most crucial virtue. It's one of the most crucial virtues. So the friendship between a father and a daughter is so much more important than whatever science he's doing at his laboratory. Whatever job you have, it doesn't matter. If you can't have a decent, at least just a decent relationship with your son or daughter, you don't have ethos. You don't have reason. Oh, so more about this, this scientific man in, in that example. Um, all of these cognitive processes, reason, logic, the scientific method, analytics, uh, these are very left brain uh, functions of the mind. And it's not the highest mode of living or thinking. It's simply not the highest way to do things. Um, Higher than these is awareness, a kind of neutral awareness where you uh, you have a thought or you're having some logical process and you're aware that you're having a logical process and then you're aware that you're aware that you're having a logical process. And uh, when you're in that state of awareness all the time, you don't need to do any of this reason, logic, ethos stuff because we're born with an inclination towards goodness, actually. And... Uh, the problem is we have all these things that get in the way. So we need to clean all these vices, clean the dirt out of our mind. And once you do that cleaning process, which you can use ethos to do, um, 
then you can just live in awareness in a moment to moment basis. That's actually what I do now. But even higher than awareness, there's Sat Chit Ananda. And you, you have to speak in Sanskrit to actually get to, to those topics. Um, all right, second part of postmodernism definition. Acute sensitivity to the role of ideology in asserting and maintaining political and economic power. So this part of the definition is really entirely political, societal, materialistic, mundane. I won't even bother. Uh, the ethos, this lecture series, my book, what Aristotle was trying to teach us about thousands of years ago, uh, it's all about the individual and the complete happiness for the individual. When the individual is completely happy, his friends and family are more happy, benefited by this, and it expands outward. The community is happy, the society is happy, the city is happy, the country, etc. But it's about the individual. It's all about the individual. This political economic power, this is, it's not our concern. Even if we're a politician, even if we are Bill Gates, Zuckerberg, whatever, our goal in life is not just to be powerful and use our power. We, we first have to have ethos. We first have to have good friends, good family, be honest, be generous, um, be magnanimous, be decent, be just, because <laughs> there's so much happiness in it. When you, like generosity is a really good one. When you give in virtue, you don't expect anything in return and you give to someone who truly needs it and you know their life is fully benefited from that, not only is it so much pleasure and honor, but you become a better person. So the next time you want to be generous, you're even more generous and it just keeps exponentially increasing and vice is the same way. So actually when you do bad things, it gets easier to do more bad things. But anyway, if you are the person who cares more about gaining higher political office, name and fame, or more power, and you'd rather have those things than having good friends, good family, um, having honor, pleasure. Pleasure is part of good character. You actually have to have pleasure to have a complete life. So if you just want power and money instead of all those other things of a good, wholesome, complete, happy life, look, ethos is not for you. You got to find a different book, maybe uh, something by Aleister Crowley, perhaps. Okay, that being said, let's admit it's obvious that ideology has a significant role in asserting and maintaining political and economic power. Isn't it obvious? Um, but postmodernism is a problem because many postmodernists, especially now in universities, many professors and different people, they're claiming ideology is the primary way that people go for power and that power is the primary way to live. Um, this is what, I mean, I, I don't want to go into it. You should watch more Jordan Peterson videos on, on this sort of thing. It's not actually relevant to ethos because ethos is about the individual and the individual does not, the individual does not actually want to be powerful. You have a desire for power and that's, there's a true desire there. But when you fulfill that desire to gain power, which I have, at least power in your own individual life, you see there's a ceiling to it. Especially in the materialistic world, when you have, you know, you have emperor of the country, the world, and you have all the women, all the money, whatever, it doesn't fix your problems. You're not completely happy just from having power. But when you have a desire for power of ethos, if you want to have power over your, your virtues and vices, power over your behaviors, your character, your, your relationships, uh, that's fine. That's ethos. You should have a desire to uh, to acquire these things and to have power over your own life. And when you do get that good kind of power, then you get real happiness. Like, I just have to give back. 
I don't have to think, oh, well, what would be the generous thing to do? It's in my character, so I'm just like, I have to do this. And that's why this book is free. I don't, like, I've been so successful, I don't need money, really. And I don't even need honor. I'm already a high-valued, honored person in many places. Like, I'm all set. So it's my time to be generous, magnificent, and magnanimous. That's uh, why I'm doing this. Okay, I hope you like this, uh, this first uh, lecture video. So don't be stupid. <laughs> Buy and download my book now because it's free. Ethos, Complete Happiness and Excellence by Way of Virtue and Reason by Alexander Campanella. Um, so you could just search that title on all these ebook sites and I'm sure you'll find it on the first result. Uh, or you can click on the link below in the video description. It will be totally free until Feb February 14, 2020. Uh, the day after is my birthday, and then I'll make some money. It may not be on Amazon Kindle right now because they don't allow uh, a free discount promotion with my publisher. Ethos is growing. Logos is rising. That's it. Goodbye.